Jimi Hendrix hit the London scene like a, a bomb. Every band, every guitarist uh, wanted to see him. We went down to the Scotch and everyone was standing perfectly still listening to this guy. I'd never seen anyone quite like him. But he called me over to sit next to him and he said, I think you're beautiful. <laughs> oh, I thought that's corny. <laughs> but it worked. <laughs> he'd never crossed a road in England before and he'd only arrived that morning and I looked to see if there was a taxi coming and Jimmy looked the opposite direction coming from America, stepped out and nearly got run over. I grabbed him by the back of his jacket just in time to pull him back. Otherwise there wouldn't have been any Jimi Hendrix. He would have been squashed there and then. That, that night but at the hotel, we talked all night. He was just a very gentle sort of person. We suddenly became boyfriend and girlfriend, and it stayed like that for two and a half years. It wasn't exactly glamorous in those early days. We stayed in a lot. We played games, we played Monopoly, we played Risk. We used to jokingly call each other by our middle names. Jimmy was Marshall and I was Mary. The Wind Cries Mary came about after Jimmy and I had a row over my mashed potatoes. They were all lumpy and he complained and I took great offence at this. And um, I stormed out and he followed me to the traffic lights. So I got into a taxi and uh, off I went. The traffic lights, they turn blue tomorrow. And when I got back, he'd actually written Wind Cries Mary all in one sitting overnight. And um, that was about the, about the row. And the wind, it cries very... The change came around late 68, when you had all these hangers-on. And I went to the United States, and this guy came round, and he put a bag down on the floor, and the bag gaped open, and there was white powder in it. And right on the top sat a gun silver-coloured handgun, and I think that was the breaking point. I saw that, and I wanted to go home. The Thursday afternoon, he died on the Friday morning, I saw him in Kensington Market, and he seemed fine. He came up to me and squidged me round the waist and said, oh, I'm staying at the Cumberland Hotel. Do you want to come over for a drink later? And I, in fact, I didn't go. My friend called me up. She said, Jimmy's dead, I've just heard it on the radio. And according to her, I didn't say anything. I put the phone down, I didn't say a word. I tuned into the radio and they were beginning to report it. Hendrick's dead at 27. I was really upset. I still remember it now. It did cross my mind that had I gone round there, it might not have happened. If only I'd have done this, if only. There's no point in dwelling on that. I didn't go, and it happened. I've never visited the grave, because I prefer to remember him as he was.